Yeah. Because. Fantastic. Are you with the group that just came to robotics. town? The robotics no. company? No. No, I work for Fuel Cell Energy. Oh. Which is just sure. down the road. Yeah. Very cool. Interesting. So, we're going to get started now um, with the Winston Community Bookstore's discussion on automation and um, job loss, which does not mean anything negative about uh, automation. automation. It's what we do about it. It's what, how we remediate it. Um, now, the thing is, you're not going to understand what the problem is with job loss and stagnant wages and all that sort of thing if you don't actually understand what the real problem was. All we keep hearing is bringing jobs back from China or anything like that. And it wasn't until I heard former Governor Rendell of Pennsylvania mention last fall on a TV news show that NAFTA didn't take anywhere near as many jobs as automation in his state. Um, and this seems so at odds with, with the call to bring jobs back to the U.S. And it really caught my attention and I started thinking about all the jobs during my lifetime that have disappeared or have been transformed into something else. Gas station attendance back in the 1960s when I got my license, you know, used to wash your window check and your oil, check your oil, uh, you know, 17 cents a gallon for gas, give you a glass and uh, s and green stamps to boot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now your gas station attendant sits inside, takes your money and says, uh, and wants to know what gas pump you're on as you're pumping your own for you know three or four bucks a gallon. And uh, so the job has been transformed and a lot of that is automation. Yeah, no, but actually that was really a corporate thing to get rid of employees. Right. Do your own gas. We're not gonna right. pay right. somebody to pump but, your I mean, gas. It's a sociological change. That's right. Okay. But, that, but the thing is, with, with ATM cards and things like that, it makes it a lot easier to do these things. Yeah, but that was going on long before that. Well, not I in mean, the 60s there. I didn't no, have an no, ATM card. No, no, I know, but by the, okay. by the 80s and 90s, but you were pumping your own gas. Okay, but what it, the thing is, this has been <coughs> happening throughout time, but people yes. don't seem to realize. Uh, let's look, you know, you can look back to the Luddites in, in, in England in the early 19th century. Okay. Who uh, used to, and these were not necessarily the lowest uh, uh, jo job uh, uh, people. Not the, these were the skilled people, and they would be uh, they were the weavers, and they would go in and break the frames, the weaving frames. Uh, that was their response to losing right. their jobs, and the, the government had to put them down. They would set <coughs> fires to the building and all that, and the government actually had to come in and take their troops away from. Them. Uh, Wellington or whatever, and uh, and and um, try and stop these uh, strike breakers. But anyways, uh, and of course, uh, telephone operators are, have been passe. Uh, can you think of any other jobs in your? I was hoping that we didn't have too many twenty-year-olds that couldn't that were coming to this that uh, <laughs> I couldn't think of anything because everything is new and up to the minute. But uh, I'm sure there's a lot of jobs. I mean, bookkeeping has been transformed. Because you could do all this stuff on I your own watch. <laughs> it doesn't mean they've necessarily lost their jobs. No. It's just been transformed. So, anyways, um, I'm sh uh, the the CNN money report uh, talked about the rise of machines, and they bought, used the Ball State University study, and they discussed manufacturing jobs. About eighty seven percent of the manufacturing losses were due to automation. 13% due to trade. Right. So, uh, and s simply put, it requires fewer workers to make the same amount of cars as it did in 2000. Because how many less were employees? Right. Uh, a lot less employees can make the same amount because it's automated. And the same thing goes for the steel industry, the coal industry. The coal industries get a double whammy because it's not just being automated, the states are using less in order to fuel there. The, uh, let me give you an example of what's happening because of not just primarily automation, but also jobs going overseas with the auto industry. Back in Warren, Ohio, where I'm from, that area, in 1973, the two major, this is, steel was going full throttle then back then, but the two major auto 
places, one employed 24,600 people in one plant and to make electrical harnesses for cars. The other plant employed 27,800 making cars. And it was brand new, it was called Lordstown. It was like uh, about three years old. Now Lordstown has I think fewer than 600 people. And Packard, which made the harnesses, because this was a place where they had the Packard, started the Packard motor car, uh, had fewer than 600, they were going down to 300. From 24,673 to 300 people in the same plant. And that's, and so all of the other plants that relied on them are gone. Uh, light bulbs, General Electric that used to make light bulbs in that area. No more plant, no more nothing, nobody. Gone, all the steel gone, all the specialty steel gone. Uh, it's, and that's, a lot of it is automation. Some of it is moving the, the plants away or just dismembering them. But a lot of it is automation, and I talked to, the reason I say that is I talked to one tool and die maker when I was there last year, and he said, the only reason I exist is because I am a tool and die maker, and they cannot replace me with automation. And he said, so I have a job. If I want to be 90 years old, I still have a job. But he said, I'm one of the only people that does. He said it's either they send the jobs overseas or they replace them with automation. And I found that fascinating. Yeah. My father was a tool and die maker. He had a job until he couldn't stand up anymore. Right. You know, basically is what he had. And if he felt like, oh, my shoelace broke this morning, I'm not going in, they wouldn't say two things to him because it, they're so rare these days. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that is not spoken about a lot when we talk about sending jobs abroad because of cost of how many plants in this country are making Volkswagens? Mercedes, BMWs, um, and the Japanese cars. Those countries have also sent a lot of manufacturing to this country. Now, I don't know how that works out. I suspect it's because of automation that they don't have the same employee expense. But I want to hear from somebody who's doing this. Uh, so, my experience has been uh, with automation with fuel cell. I am a tool maker. Uh, I'm not a degreed engineer. I worked my way up from being a tool and die maker. Oh, my dad oh, owned a shop in Thomaston and I grew up in the business. And um, business. with the, um, the advent of the automation line, for fuel cell, their considerations, the genesis of their considerations were uh, a couple of things. One were, uh, one of the highest was the money that they were putting out for um, injuries, uh -huh. uh, repetitive injuries, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Um, in our plant, uh, there's a lot of handwork, and um, the the people that came up with this process, uh, our head office in Danbury, they're scientists, basically, not manufacturers. And so uh, the plant in Torrington is a little outdated. And so the other driver for uh, automation was um, that uh, we didn't want to build a new plant in South Korea. We partnered with a Korean company during the 08 downturn. Uh, they helped us get through that. And they also um, uh, helped us uh, have um, redundancy, which um, initially uh, there's a fuel cell park that we just completed in Bridgeport. And that uh, deal went through after that announcement that we were putting this plant in South Korea. Mm -hmm. So it helped us. And um, the other thing was, um, we didn't want to invest in old welding technology, build brand new plant and use old technology. Mm -hmm. So we were thrust into uh, lasers. And when I came on to fuel cell five years ago, there was a, a laser cell on the floor that they had attempted to, to uh, initiate. 
uh, released to operations and it was horribly, uh, it had gone horribly awry, but me and a small team uh, rebuilt it and it's in operation now. The, uh, the concept of our automation is not so much to replace people. We still need eyes on the line looking at the quality of this product. Um, there's 30 people on the line in uh, South Korea uh, that replaces two departments here. Um, it, how many people? That I don't Roughly. know, but okay. more than, maybe twice that. Okay. Um, but the, the genesis was automated lift assist. It's not so much that we wanted to get labor off the floor, but we wanted to not have them holding big uh, pieces of sheet metal next to their neck walking from one station to the, ne the next, which currently goes on. And uh, we're seeking to uh, shore up our business with sales so that we can bring that automation line, a duplicate of it here. And we uh, are just finishing up an expansion to our building more than twice the size uh, for that's some warehousing. In, that's in Bridgeport? No, this is in Torrington. In Torrington? Yeah. So, um, that's kind of why I wanted to come uh, and uh, have a voice at this because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, replacing people wasn't the the, the genesis. And over the, uh, over my time, I mean, certainly uh, when I was learning to be a tool maker, there was a lot of form grinding. There was a lot of really highly technical things that you only could do if you had the experience. But now there's you know wire uh, electrical discharge machining which takes the place of a lot of that, makes tool makers' jobs um, much less technical than they were, much less clever. You know, tool makers have always Safer. been very clever yeah, right. people. Oh, yeah. uh, because they're doing basically what and we're create. doing now with computers, you're they were doing you have to be creative. by hand. Yes, yeah. by hand. Yeah. And finding ways uh, to make that work. It took longer, it, there was more effort, there was less accuracy or more room for uh, less accuracy. Yeah, and th this is why the McKinsey re report and the um, the Economist report were, were so important because it was they were much more nuanced than saying they're just taking jobs away. What it, uh, the McKinsey report said their finding was about um, while automation will eliminate very few occupations entirely in the next decade, it will affect portions of almost all jobs to a greater or lesser degree. To be able to expand what you're doing, um, and uh, to take out the, you know, in, in this case the the um, what the risk, the danger, the, the yeah. risk, the danger, but also some of the stuff that could be better done by a mach machine and quicker. Um, there were all sorts of examples they were giving about legal uh, legal aids, and all that sort of thing. We're able to uh, with the use of being able to computers, you can do much more. It's just like with a cotton gin. If you go back as far as that, a slave, because I, I just did a program on this the other day. Now a slave who, by hand, could only do short staple crop, do one pound a day. With a cotton gin, he could do 50 pounds a day. So it made... Invention of a wheel. Right. So basically, this is just a continuation. Um, and with automation, what, what the, the big deal with automation is that it takes over routine in, in manufacturing jobs, but in a lot of jobs. The routine, the repetitive, uh, that is what machines can do. And, uh, you know, with as well as lift heavy things. And lift, lift heavy things, yes, wonderful. Um, I wish my back had had that a number of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a lot better. Um, uh, and the risk factor for jobs is based on how much of your job is repetitive. Mm. But it is also on whether it costs more to have the, the equipment in. To, to bring in the equipment or other factors like that. What is the cost benefit uh, uh, for that? And one of the examples, that's why I used the Pecan Scheller's little story in this from 1938, I think it was in um, Arizona. And it was very cheap to have these migrants do the work of Shelley. There was equipment available, but it was expensive. And at one point, they, uh, because this is the Depression and everything, and they, they cut the migrants even more, and they went on strike, and it was a horrible strike, and all this sort of thing, and they were 
until the public decided, okay, enough with this, and made them sit down, uh, and the um, and the un they were able to have a union. The problem was, 1938, the federal government finally established a minimum wage of 25 cents. That was so much higher than what these people were making that, um, yeah, they got their job back <coughs> temporarily, or as long as it took to bring to in new equipment. Machine. Yeah. So every time they talk about bringing jobs back, a lot of these are very low-skilled jobs that would be replaced by automation. So that, that is something people uh, have to think about. Um, and uh, so bringing jobs, and, it, and it, some of the jobs, like especially with Mexico, it's just coming over the border, and part of it's done here, part of it's done there. And it, it, there is a lot of people that would be hurt here. And of course, agricultural, they don't like to get rid of the NAFTA either. But anyways, um, the uh, the other thing was. But there there are jobs even today, and I I think you mentioned it. You heard it on NPR, and I did. Uh, in France, lace makers. People that sit there just tatting lace, which you think no automation can do, they found a way for automation to do it now, and all of these super skilled lace, lace makers. makers are out of work. So it's not just, I mean, something you'd never think they could find a way to do. Yeah. And, and so all of these people, and they're up in arms because they've literally been replaced by right. machines. Yeah, the technological, what's underlying this is technological progress, which has been fairly continuous and, and constant over time, except that it's reached higher and higher stages. And you have a displacement of the workforce from agriculture, which was mechanized, to manufacturing which has been mechanized to the service sector and people 15 or 20 years ago were talking about the service sector economy but it turns out that's a minimum wage right uh, and uh, that's why their jobs are safe uh, 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 ghetto if almost mm -hmm. as you please right and so people are talking now about the quaternary economy which is information technology and maintenance right. of uh, networks and so on and so forth so but under what's new i think is that where previously automation, automated things you did with your arms and legs, muscle power, carrying things from place to place. Automation now is also doing brain power, mm -hmm. right? And that's the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. For example, IBM has just licensed Watson to be used uh, for agriculture and industry and elsewhere. Uh, and we have robots which don't simply amplify or, or augment uh, or supplement uh, human power. They entirely replace it. And so th those are new dimensions to things, and, and I think that's going to be the challenge to figure out how you maintain a stable and good society when, in fact, this process, which is to a large extent eliminating the types of jobs that most people did, is occurring. Yeah, some of the jobs that brought people, the lower, the lower skilled ones that brought them into the middle class, but some of those are protected because even though there is equipment out there to do it, like in the food service and, and all that, because the jobs are paid low and the equipment is high, um, it's cheaper, especially if they're only part-timers and things like that. That's one of the reasons why that is, but it makes me a little concerned when they're talking $15 an hour. It might just mean that you're going to end up losing your job because they will bring in machines. And that sounds a little strange to us, but it, it can be done. And although I don't see going into a, a, a restaurant with waiters and waitresses, since they make minimum wage, or less than minimum wage, they rely on their tips, that they're a little bit safer. But, um, but, but they gave remember, a lot of examples. Remember the automat. Yeah, the, the automat, <laughs> yeah, that. right. And, uh, you know, that, but the uh, fast food workers, I would really be concerned about if, if the, the income got so high that they could be replaced. Um, and one would hope that was only a stepping stone onto something else anyways. You know, you don't really want to do, or, or an ending career for, you know, whatever. Um, but the, the thing that's really getting people very nervous is a lot of middle class jobs, mi middle skill jobs that uh, were like accountants and bookkeepers. And I know bookkeeping is like, you can't get a job as a bookkeeper. Uh, like what I was, because that's all done on, you, you put it, some information it takes into the machine, it takes care of inventory, it takes sales, you know, uh, the whole thing, Taxes, is yeah. yeah, and all that can be done, yeah. 
in what, like just in a few keystrokes instead of having you know five individual people doing each part of it. Um, because I used to work in a bookkeeping office. I know those things have gone. Um, and even accountants are, are being hit by this because all that data collection is such a huge thing for um, with computers. And uh, you know we all love our computers. Sometimes we hate them, um, especially when they don't work quite right because uh, we are so dependent upon them. But they, you know, we can't treat them as the enemy. But at the same time, you don't. One of the things of one comment was made by one of these uh, things is that. We don't want to demonize our, uh, our computers and things like that, but we don't mind de demonizing foreigners. And with that, we have to break, because that is not helpful. That's interesting. That is not helpful, because that doesn't solve the problem. Because the problem is the rate of pa the pace of automation now. Because every year, it's building upon itself. I mean, just even looking at what computers can do now, I mean, I'm like, like way back there. And, and this is more powerful than what brought man to the moon. Exactly. In terms of its computing ability. What, what I, in the 1960s and 70s, when I Amazing. worked in an office, you had a huge uni a, a, a computer room with a big univac with three data entry key punch operators, and then five or six of us out there, because I, I you know, was printing out my, my, bill, my invoices on a my mimeograph machine, which <laughs> Uh, could go right. into a museum. Uh, so, I mean, things have really changed. All that can be done with the push of a button. Now, it can be probably done on some of those fancy watches now. I mean, you know. So, it, it's, you know, it, the pace, it's the pace that is making, we don't have time to, and you don't have time to train people. Uh, this was another point. You don't have time to, uh, even if you don't concentrate on college education, but you concentrate on vocational education, that the changes t are so fast in less than three years that the stuff that you're teaching them is outdated. So it has to be done with the businesses. Like uh, they gave an example. Well, more like, more like um, what Mark was saying, you know, you're back to the old on the job. You learn on the job. Yep. You learn the old apprentice kind of uh, It can approach, be helpful. Right? There is a, a company, a German company in North Carolina, I was reading in, in one of these articles, that was building wind turbines. And what they were doing was having the, the people going to the community college and getting a degree in, in mechatronics or something like that. And, and also working on the job. So they were getting paid as they learned. And, they, and, their, and their education was free. So very, that is a very old tradition. Yep, but it wasn't a five or seven year, it wasn't a five or seven year apprenticeship. As far as college uh, and university, you have also high skilled people, are, uh, if their stuff, if their position is something that can be replicated because there's a lot of automatic data that can be taken care of, their jobs are in jeopardy too because they make money and it'd be, you know, it'd be cheaper to replace them. So it's not as though it's just the lower, the, uh, the working class, the, but the middle class and some of the uh, higher paid professionals really uh, have a lot of uh, skin in this game and, and the idea of how we fix it. So this, uh, it's, there's a lot of ideas behind this um, as to whether uh, regular college is, is worth, um, worth it, uh, should it be, you know, and there's always this, this yeah. thing, should it be more vocational training yeah, or I gotta jump in on that though, just quickly because, yeah, please. you know, teaching people how to think and, and understand things, I think is a basic, uh, a basic premise of hum the human right. condition and civilized society and right. civilizing of society. So I don't think those should ever be confused, that you go to college to learn a job. You go to college to learn how to think, learn how to it's be exactly. a grown-up in a, in a civilized society, in a democratic, participatory society. That's what people should be going to college for. Agreed. Now, should it be four years? Does law school need to be three years? Does medical school need to be four? I mean, yeah, that's yeah. all yeah. stuff that can be discussed because right. there, there's real, right. but, but education is, 
you know, this, there's, there's that element of this whole discussion, the anti-education yeah, crowd yeah. that doesn't believe in liberal arts education. Yeah. So you don't need to know the, how to do that. You need to know that you're going to be a learner for the rest of your exactly. life. And, and you're going to have to be retrained right. constantly. You need to know that you should be a learner. Yes. Well, yeah. that's that but you're that's going to be. you're going to have to be in order to survive in this kind of uh, that's right. uh, adaptability is survivability. And adaptability kind of comes from knowledge, from and, and the the things. willingness to to be retrained and to keep learning. That's the key word I think in this whole discussion is adapt, mm -hmm. because we always have it, mm -hmm. as uh, whether it was automation or industrialization or anything we adapt and we are we can't go backwards no. i think that would be a wrong direction to limit well, technology you say we can't right how I, do you put that back okay, that, that, that's like putting yeah. toothpaste back in the tube yeah. <laughs> correct correct so the the question is then how do we adapt to it how yeah. do we how do we and education train is a how big do we part educate yeah correct and and this is this is why we have to get our representatives our uh in, in government and our policy, you know, our policymakers, our educational people, all on board with the idea of what is really needed, what is really the problem. Not a, none of this, like, bring, you know, that's going to solve everything. Is bring the jobs back? Uh, well, that's just a that's just an idea. I know, see it. I a, know. And, but people to, believe it, and yeah. actually, I was sort of fooled by it too a little bit there because it's it's, it's to placate people who don't know how to think about these things. And then I started thinking, well, as soon as I heard Renosa, they get I started thinking about all the jobs that have gone by the board. They get angry, they get scared, and then they overreact. And, and if you're 50 years old, who wants to think about being retrained again? Look, even the jobs I mean, coming back in coal mines are going to be automated. That's right. And the number well, of people who are going to work on these, on these uh, machines and brought yes. back yeah. is going to be fairly limited. But it, it's clear that, you know, whereas before uh, uh, automation uh, and technological projects, progress pr produced the mechanization of muscle power. It's now replacing it with robots. And we've gone to the mechanization of brain power, mm -hmm. which is brand new. Right? Well, let's, uh, let's say adding machines would have been the first example of that. That goes <laughs> yeah. back a few centuries. Sure. But if we look at the information technology based on computers, mm -hmm. then we've got the mechanization of everything that we considered previously to be human. Mm -hmm. Muscle power and brain power. And so the question is, how, let's look at it in terms of adaptation. How do we adapt to that in order to continue what we consider to be a good society, which gives meaningful employment to people? Right. And right. That's, that's a big challenge. I mean, we're, we're looking at an interesting crisis of uh, public higher education, not just here in Connecticut, but throughout the, uh, throughout the country. And in general, the indebtedness of students, right, is now at about $1.3 trillion. Yeah. They cannot renegotiate their loans at lower rates like we can do our mortgages. Oh, they yeah. cannot get out of that debt through But bankruptcy. those are things that could be fixed. Yeah, those, those could be fixed. But the, one can predict that the next bubble is going to be the higher education bubble. The next recession, whenever that might be coming, is really going to impact that in a serious way. Well, so yeah, especially that's if they get rid of Pell Grants and all this sort of thing, yeah. then you'll have schools that are empty. <laughs> well, because which is just what they want. Yes, exactly. They. <laughs> well, and, 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 and Buckley, Buckley, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, William Buckley believed only the elite should go to school, That's right. should go to college. William Buckley? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. William Buckley came. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, we know William Buckley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there there is a lot, unfortunately, there's an awful lot of folks in the elite that truly do believe that. I mean, still the tripartite system of higher education, which was pioneered in California with Clark Kerr, the community right. college, the state, the, the, the state, the university. university, and the university of the state, right? That system has now sort of, you know, financially and, and fiscally come apart, yes. right? And we have, a, and, and there are a number of problems. We have unqualified students going to university mm -hmm. who need remedial math and remedial English and so on and so forth. We have, at my university, we have three philosophy departments in remedial math. I usually bring oh that statistic up. God. That's the, 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 the outlay involved in that. Um, those, those, they should be going to community college. So there's, there has to be a whole reorganization of, of what is happening. Uh, we look at New York State, which is now offering on a limited basis, income dependent, uh, free public, uh, free bachelor's degrees, right? Uh, Connecticut is gonna have to come up with some model other than the one that's currently being proposed, which is 
centralization and, and perhaps closings in order to be able to compete with that. Mm -hmm. So there's a big challenge, both in terms of the question of the extension of automation to brain power, and also what is the future of higher education and particular public higher education. Well, especially with online learning. You don't even need a bricks and mortar anymore. Well, uh, and you, can, you can teach your philosophy enough. class, oh, and I, I can watch it from... Uh, and and this is why I refuse to do it online. And I, and I wish you would have signed up, because I was one student short. You should have called me. I'd love to take your course. Oh, That's worry. right. Yeah. Let us know. You have to ask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, got, I, I did manage to get some seniors into my courses a couple times in order to make I sure mean, they I got I don't promise I'll take the final, but I'll participate. Right. <laughs> my husband enjoyed the class oh, very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's online. Class. Huh? It's online. It's online? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, do, I do history and philosophy of science from Plato to, to Darwin. No, that'd be uh, interesting. I'd love to take those classes. The, uh, the, the, the interesting thing what, to me was about their whole thing about online courses. They said, you know, teaching never has to work. Because, because, and then they start talking about online courses. And I'm like, oh. So the teacher is no longer being the instructor, but the good friend is basically. The coach, the coach model. The coach model, yeah. yeah. So you're, you're now a coach instead of a teacher. And I'm like, oh. Well, there's an improvement, but because the thing is, when I, I the reason why I didn't online courses can have their place. I mean, I've taken some of those too, but when you have students and you and my my thought for that was, um, I when you say to them, well, did you get it? Did you understand it? When you're a person face to face, you can tell, but you, but there, well, yes or something like that, and they type yes, you can't tell, there's no inflection in that <laughs> word. That yeah, they but the point is in this discussion is that that's gonna change tomorrow. You're gonna be able to do a big Skype thing and Skype isn't gonna bluff out. You're gonna be able to have full conversations just like they do online diagnosis now. I mean, yeah. you can do- Well, actually, that I can handle. handle. Skype I could handle. The other, uh, the other well, online- Well, I'll just give you an example. In one of my courses, which is an on-ground course on problems of war and peace, we're going to hook up with a, an outfit out of New York, and they're going to put our students in contact with people from 10 other countries. That's awesome. They're going to do 16 hours online outside of the class for about 20 or 30% of the grade. We're still negotiating that. Um, and this is an experiment that we're trying out. So there'll be able to be students from the Netherlands, from, uh, from uh, India, Tunisia, from etc. Can you explain that again? Wow. What, what's, what's the connection to this? Other countries? Uh, the students, well, there'll be a, it'll, it'll be on screen, as far as I understand it, and you'll be able to see the faces of students from a half a dozen other countries, and they will form a group of eight students, right? And those students will meet over a 16 hour period. Talking right? about war and peace? War and peace well, and international together. relations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, war yeah. and And just, you know, that's I think part of it is yeah, cultural I love sensitivity. That. So that's this is something that's, to try. That's now, that's, that's where the online experience gives us something we couldn't do in the classroom. Similarly, just on online, it's not advisable for recent high school graduates to take their first courses no, online. No. Right? And in general, at the undergraduate level, it's probably not such a great idea. Although, in the summer, it is a very good idea because nobody wants to go into a hot building and travel for that. So in the summer, to supplement the courses that they've taken mm -hmm. during fall and spring, and also at, especially the master's level, where students already have an undergraduate education and they're looking for further qualification, Etc. Certification. It would allow a lot of people who have a bachelor's degree but don't have a master's degree but are working full time or uh, are involved in, in, in raising Which children. Which is already happening. Or in the military, right? But to a very limited extent. Yeah. But it, it is happening in some places. When the University of Phoenix tried to do it at the undergraduate level, they flopped. Mm -hmm. They had actually set up at greater. Yeah, well, people places. have to grow up. A and, and your graduate degree is usually a mentoring thing, anyways. Right. So you know, it's 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 a question of judgment. And Right. Yes. One, one, one formula doesn't, doesn't fit all. Right. Um, a couple of things are coming to my mind. The history of education in a thousand years ago or something like that, lecturing was how knowledge was, was purveyed. And I'm sure that there was a lot of objection to libraries and you just can't learn the same thing by reading a book as you can by having somebody lecture to you. That's one thing that's changed. And I suspect that online learning is going to have some of the same effect. There'll be more and more of that that's acceptable. 
The other thing that I've been thinking of because after David said, you know, people find meaningful work in education. If we've had this incredible increase in productivity, where has that money that's gained from increased productivity gone? And that's what raises the idea of guaranteed minimum income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's well, I mean, and it's hopefully it's people would do more than go watch NFL hockey or whatever the hell it is, <laughs> but, and just be and entertained HL. as opposed to finding meaningful occupation. But that's one of the things that I think we have to do is help people find meaningful occupation more than sitting watching the boob tube with sports. Or, or, or anything for that matter. But uh, the, the thing is, but, uh, but you know, he, the he, hours. He said something about, you know, where has all that wealth gone? Well, look at where it's gone where it's in gone. a thousand years. Um, that was a rhetoric. No, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, it's gone into improving society. Some, society is some of it has. Now that it was a thousand oh, well, years. Oh, yeah. People live right. better. And yeah. The, the quality of life. Well, that's has, also because. Some of it has, but a lot of it's of gone into of sales, this so incredible. Increase. No, you know what? You, there's no way you can convince me that the, the standard of living in the world isn't better now. I oh, agree. With all of the bad stuff that it was a thousand yeah. years ago. I'm not <laughs> arguing that point yeah. at all. I absolutely or agree. Or five thousand years. I mean, really. But in the last hundred, I couldn't have lived past the 19th century, and I realized that yeah, with, yeah. with disease. I agree yeah, with yeah. you. Right. So totally. we, the, well, we agree. the wealth of our a lot of the wealth has gone, but we've had an incredible increase in wealth disparity in this country in the last 40 years. Yeah, but not as much as there was a thousand years ago. That's no. true. No. I agree. No. Or right. even 200 years ago. Or how about 100 years yeah, ago? Yeah, but, but that's right now there is some wealth back. disparity. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I, Worldwide, that wealth disparity isn't less now than it was 50 Worldwide, years ago. Yeah. But I get it. It's always an issue to be looked at and considered. Mm -hmm. okay. But I, I think we're we've been moving in the right direction on that I for agree. a thousand years yeah. or oh, yeah. more. Yeah, if you look over a long that's span well, of time. That's what but if you're looking over through. a short span of time, like for Those are the, the, that's yeah, this, that's, but that's, when you look yeah. over history, it's yeah. been that. And well, the, you know, yeah, we get it, we get it. <laughs> uh, Thank you for that. Yeah, but the idea is, are people working less hours after, with all this Productivity. Well, not, not us, but <laughs> well, no, no, no. But I'm, I'm saying is the people that are in the workforce are their hours being cut so that other people can also join yes. in on, that? or is it that flex time? Or is there any benefits to this um, increased productivity but less people in the workforce? Is there any upside to that? I think the library in uh, in um, New Hartford has two people who work more than 30 hours a week. They have a 35 hour, that's full time mm -hmm. for them. Two people out of 10, the rest of them are kept below 30 hours for insurance purposes and so on and so forth. Benefits purposes, yeah. Yeah, yeah benefits, benefits purposes. Which if- That's we, a particular problem in this country. And that's a policy, right. another and policy- It would not be a problem use. in, even if you go just north of the border of Canada. No. Right. And so one has to, you know, I think that that has to change over and, time. And that was part of the one of the things was policies have to change in order to uh, be able to, uh, you know, for people that are either between jobs, less hours in jobs, so if they aren't getting insurance, you need to have the, these things provided. And that is the, the role of universal of health care. Right. Yeah, that's the role of government. I mean, so, yeah. government is, is, is enjoying the benefits of all this automation and everything. One of the things that was a caution, though, was that with this jump in automation and so quickly, some of the third world countries that are trying to get up into the higher, they don't have the middle class, and it's, it's going to be coming even more disparate, is what they were trying to say, because you don't have this uh, chance to get uh, into a lower skilled job and move into a higher skilled job, you know, as you get right. training. Uh, and uh, it's been, especially if you bring jobs back. How's that different than it's ever been? Because, well, the thing is, th that has been the competition in the world in the last, you know, globalization. Uh, and a lot of these countries, and, and you really are going to have constant warfare if you don't have uh, a settled middle class in these, in these countries, I think. 
So that was one of the concerns that was brought up in here. But that's now, how, that's how the, the global economists, the ones who support the global economy, mm -hmm. say that that's what's going to take care of it, is globalizing the economy. Will help these next world yeah. countries develop a more stable economy with better workforces. Then. Yeah, and they're, but they're but saying now that's their better. argument, yeah. and I'm sure there's plenty of yeah. arguments to the other yeah. side yeah. around yeah. that. But that's what their philosophy is. That yeah, and one would a rising tide lifts all ships, ships and, and not and just that, yachts. <laughs> and that should happen worldwide. Yeah. and there is some evidence of that, though. I mean, I think so too. I think so. I too. I'm not agreeing with everything because there's been. Uh, that was written in these articles because there's a lot of people on, bo on yeah. a whole bunch Every of sides. Side of yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and one of the interesting things is, no, I'm not in favor of driverless cars. And the other scary thing I heard yesterday, drive, Boeing is trying out dri driverless yeah, airplanes. Air, yeah. uh, commuter planes. Hey, listen, rockets, they don't pilot rockets to the moon. Though. That's all driverless. I don't care. That's when I'm on an airplane, I want That's Sully on it. with me. It's not you. It's harder to get to the moon. Because if something goes wrong, uh, look at that. If they couldn't have put duct tape on Apollo or whatever it was, they would never have made it back. That's there true. There had to have been somebody there to fix it. But there have been plenty of unmanned yeah. space flights that have done it. Yeah, yeah, but they're things. unmanned. Unwomened also. Uh, un if they're <laughs> unpeopled, I don't care. Yeah. But if I'm on it, yeah. <laughs> I want but somebody on there who can fix it. Yeah. And it doesn't have an argument with me. Right. Right. That space exploration <laughs> should mainly be done Please, by robots. Please, I used to live with the locks and then we all... Do you want to send the bin humans back to the moon or even to Mars? Or do you want to continue the, the, the exploration of the outer uh, solar system with a uh, robot? Uh, so the, the, the question comes up there too. The relationship between humans and robots. Yeah. That's going to be a big And, and it's going to be tricky. When I think in driverless cars, I'm thinking, well, how do you, you do what that? What are you talking about? We already have a relationship with robots. I mean, that's that's and that's a good thing. I mean, who wants to go? To, who wants to be the miner, the canary in the mine shaft? Now they put a robot down yeah, there, right? Or uh, you know, all of these things as you're saying. We, we, yeah, the I mean, only reason we know as much about the universe as we do is because of we robots. send ro robots out there. Well, maybe David's talking about the intimacy of the relationship <laughs> yeah, yeah. between. Well, and also the ethical. <laughs> Whatever. There, there are some ethical questions. Come up. <laughs> Think of Asimov's famous rules no, from, the, from the robot series. Yeah. Yes. That was a, an anticipation. But you know, most of these things are always looked at negatively as opposed to in a positive yeah, way. Yeah, and I, I, like and I said, I just have the, 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 object, uh, you know, the objection. I, I think of, of the incredible problems with driverless cars when you have people on the road that drive cars. Plus, but, I also you know, think... subways are basically driverless. I yeah, mean, but they're not in the same traffic You're street. not used to it, that's all. But well, it's, there are examples of those things yeah, out there. And, and I realize that if they're on a different level, uh, that that's <laughs> fine. But I mean, really, uh, it, it's great. It's it's it seems like so. I mean, well, that is almost you're a not step too far. With it, but you know, what, cars in the, in, already now some many cars, but in my my a few years from now, they all have the standard, which is the forward-looking radar, yeah, which mm -hmm, stops mm -hmm. the car to yeah. and have a collision. Yeah, so fine. we're we're and the lane. Oh, in a hundred years, so all of that. You won't have to worry in, in about two or three it. Years, <laughs> yeah, that's all going to be there. So we're already going to have in all our cars driverless <laughs> components in any case. Right? And but the sales, uh, the sales advertising would certainly have to change because now cars are sold as being sexy and fast oh, and great to drive. And yeah. that's the way they've always sold cars. Yeah. And, and yes. America has well, had know, a love affair with their cars. Young people don't think that so much that way now about cars. Oh, are you kidding? Vroom, vroom. No, I'm saying now, it, cars have always been sold like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deal with the advertisements from but the 60s and 70s. But people are saying, always, I don't want a car. Yeah. yeah. So the young crowd will come up and say, hey, if somebody else can drive me, Uber. Well, the, the car my dad traded in, it had an option where you could set it to parallel park itself. Yeah. And it's like, um, I think a lot of the like self-driven cars have the option for a person driving it to take over and everything. So I yeah. think we... Oh, well, that's, that's the way, that's the, the transition that would have to of be. Course. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how it is. Well, by the just testing ones that can't By the time you're my age, yeah. you, probably, you won't be driving. You'll get yeah. in something. <laughs> <laughs> how many people... Who drove here this morning? I walked. You walked. How many people who drove this morning and they were going to make a left hand turn stuck their arm out the window? <laughs> no. Good point. Nobody. See? No. Nobody. 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 Because I'd have to figure out how to put the window but, down. That's, that's, that's right. We don't do that anymore. But Nobody my point is, no, we don't have a transition. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing it now in terms of the transition yeah, from 
fossil based fuel to, to electrical. All electric cars, with some exceptions, are, are fairly limited. The hybrid cars have a slightly larger market, and I think that's the transition. We'll also see it in terms of the, the, the ability of the cars to drive themselves and human driving. It's going to be a hybrid model, right. which, which and, leads and, us on. And then you go, we go back to just where I was talking about more in Ohio, or Terrytown, New York, where the, you don't need so many big plants anymore because you've got the robots making the cars. Perfect and a few people watching the robots make the cars. And instead of having 600 people, you've got one. Right, but you also have the people who designed the robots. That's that true. Right. That's a lot of work. And who repair those. those. So that's a whole sector that has developed. Plus the materials right? that's your, that go your, into the robot. That's your tool and die maker. Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. The you're you're set for life. You don't have to worry about tool and die maker. Because <laughs> that, that's, and, and one so of the big things. Repairment. So one of the big things that they were saying, and and they seem to be in an agreement in most of the articles, is that a lot of foreign countries, especially like England and uh, I forgot what other countries, like Japan and all that, don't have the the problems of the um, because they're they're more creative societies. They they have more creativity in their jobs, so that and less. Uh, uh, replicable organization. Yeah, routine. You know. Yeah, you said it better. <laughs> um, so it's not as easily uh, able to be automated. So that is something that yeah, uh, they also have higher levels of unionization, which, from a strictly corporatist point of view, yes. limits the displacement, right? And and provides right. certain transitions for the workers. And, and these countries this country, also, as the rate of unionization has fallen, you've also seen a growth in. in minimum wage jobs, right. and you know that's a natural consequence of it. Yeah, and, and the fact that, like we were talking about health care, when you don't have to worry about these various different things in order to keep a roof over your head or keep yourself healthy, you can spend a little more time, you can be more, a little bit more creative, you don't have to do the nine to five or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and the drudge thing, you could, you could actually take a, a chance on something else working out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a route I was hoping we were taking. But Steve Mnuchin uh, has said that we don't have to worry about any of this stuff for at least another 50 or 100 years. <laughs> well, the portability of healthcare was a big thing that people liked along with, mm. you know, keeping on your parents' plan until age 26 and no mm -hmm. pre-existing conditions, right? And whatever happens, those things have to persist. And, and, mm. and I think what is eventually going to happen is we'll go through a bit of a free market uh, cold, uh, cold shower. People are going to find that they don't like it. I'm not sure that the solution in this country is a government-run plan, but there are options, and, and in fact, uh, uh, they're talking about this in terms of infrastructure, which are the equivalent of what in Great Britain or Canada would be called crown corporations, i.e. independent, autonomous from the government, but non-profit, including government input, including private sector input, etc. That hybrid model That's for health care nice would be very interesting for this country, and I think we'll, we'll probably move in that direction. Yeah, where, where are there examples of that now, David? Um, there aren't too many. Yeah, okay. and, and I'll give you just an example, though. If you look at the Canadian healthcare system, which people usually hold up as, as mm. a model, there is a significant problem. I mean, the advantage is you have all doctors in one plan, you have control over costs, you get uh, uh, much lower costs per, 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 uh, per person. However, the problem is one of technological um, uh, innovation. And it's very difficult then to get, there's a much lower proportion of MRI machines for the Canadian population compared to the American. Radio radiological treatment for cancer, et cetera, can be a problem, et cetera. And that's because capital investment is very difficult when it's a government controlled thing. Right? And so if they as would have a hybrid problem. As opposed to in this country where it's overused, yes, diagnostics right. are overused. Right. So, so they, you've they got can the, charge the hell out right, of it. Right, so you've got the two, you've got, so what you want is yeah. something in the middle here, yeah. right? And some kind of hybrid system in Canada would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. In other words, you would keep the federal plan for physician payments, but you would have some forms of uh, uh, what you might call crown corporations would have to be modified to include a private input in order to get the requisite number of x-ray machines, MRIs, etc. Right, And then you have to couple that to the system. So there has to be some innovation there too. Yeah. People have been unwilling to do it there, just like people have been unwilling to consider other options here. So it's a problem. And so we point fingers at each other. Your system doesn't work. Yes. <laughs> right. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, 
some parts of the Canadian system work and some parts don't work so well. Need some, some parts of the American work. system I, I, work well I think also because you, if you have the money or you have the insurance plan, no, you can go and get the treatment that's guaranteed. In some parts of Canada, that would, that would be a problem because you'd be on a bit of a waiting list. Or, as in the case of Quebec, actually now they're required by law to send people down to Vermont to New York State for treatment if it's going to be too delayed in critical cases. So you have to have, you know, uh, hybrid plans, I think, are the way to go in the future. And that's a way of reconciling liberals and conservatives and so forth. Because well, and that's the liberals progress. have some good ideas and the yeah. conservatives have some good <laughs> you ideas. You take the good of this and the good of that. Well, and that's the way it used to work. Well, well just Medicare itself. I mean, <laughs> Medicare as an entity works beautifully. Pretty well, yeah. yeah. It really does. Right. Yes, and the expansion and of Medicaid. And you have your choices of just staying on Medicare or going with a, and it, as, as we all know, <laughs> well, most of us, an, an additional insurer. Um, and it's, it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, they truly do keep it beautifully set up and very well uh, maintained. But, but speaking about uh, people being employed, it's interesting because I was thinking of, there are times, uh, Milton Hershey, who, Hershey chocolate, right. who invented how to keep milk chocolate from melting. Um, when he was starting Hershey, Pennsylvania, he wanted to build a hotel, and he wanted to build the Hershey Hotel because he wanted to get people into that area of Pennsylvania with a place to stay. Um, so he designed an enormous, well, you, you've probably all been there, but an enormous hotel. And this was in the late 20s, it went into the 30s, and, he's, and they said, well, you don't want to start building it, it's a profession. He said, build it. So they started building it, and he went to the site one day, and he saw all these big machines digging away to, to start down so they could get the foundation going. And he said, what are these machines doing here? He said, I don't want this automation. He said, get rid of all of them. He said, how many men could we employ if we got rid of these? <laughs> and they got rid of all of them. And he said, what about health care? How are these people going to get health care? How are they going to be fed beyond just because they were? So he set up that system for all of the workers. So it can be done in a, but he was so far ahead of his time, he was mm. one of the few that um, saw the worker as an entity that was important. Um, but the point is that yes, there are people, uh, there was a plant in Vermont that, that you probably, it, it did fleece, it did, uh, and it burned to the ground. That was in uh, Massachusetts. Yes. In that Massachusetts, in, uh, excuse me. And there's another person who the workers were were tremendously important. Yes. Kobani, who started his, and I, I have yet to figure out how he got a small business loan with no house and no, but he did, and he started Kobani Yogurt. He's now a billionaire. Oh, right. She see 60 Minutes? Yeah, yeah. And I was going, something doesn't add up here, but anyway, they never go into those little no. glitchy areas. But. Again, his workers are very important to him. That's where automation and workers work together. Because if the people at the top see the worker as important, just like what you were talking about, the guy carrying the sheet metal, you don't want to have his shoulder or his neck taken off, um, then you work together to, to improve it. It's the ones where we don't care. We'll, you know, So this guy is putting four lug nuts on you know, we can get, and, and we need 200 of them to put the lug nuts on as they go down. Well, now we don't need any. We have one machine that can do all of it. Who cares about the people? That's the difference. And so... So intent is everything. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not just, we're, big corporations, there were two guys that I know, I think I mentioned them, there, I know four billionaires, personally. Two of them are brothers. Um, Cokes? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, thank God. <laughs> so, the police introduced me to your friends. <laughs> uh, these happen to be the Boron brothers. Um, they live in New York. It's a long 
story short, father was in um, concentration camp early on, very early on. He was Polish, I believe. His wife was Romanian. He was, his family had been, uh, or was, at the time, uh, investment bankers when there weren't any in Europe. And he was one of the first ones taken away. He was one of the ones building the camps. That's how early it was. <laughs> He and another guy actually escaped because you could then. You were building the camp. He got away, got back to his wife. They sewed, sewed, sewed every diamond, emerald, you name it, into garments and fled the, the country uh, and went to Switzerland and then made it to Palestine. Uh, they went through Palestine. He was asked to stay there and help build the new country and the Allies actually, because almost everyone had been killed that knew about investment banking, actually came and asked him, would you come back to Europe and work with us on rebuilding Europe? Um, and so he said, there's only two countries I will consider, and that was northern, actually northern Italy or Scandinavia. And he settled in Milan. He became a billionaire <laughs> because he helped with the Marshall Plan and everything else in Europe to literally rebuild it. Um, he had two sons, they went through a lot of the, he had one right when he left. The next one came quite a few years later. But the point is that he entrusted his sons to build and replicate and, and how important business is and how important people are. And yet when I went in to talk to them, this was in 1988, and they had 34 businesses around the world. The two sons, he, st he was still in Europe. They had both moved to New York. Yeah, it was, and it, it was Malden Mills, the Lawrence Mass. That sounds yeah. familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I couldn't think of the name, but thank you. Well, that's, that's yeah. why we have technology. That's why we have technology to do our thing but, for us. But the point was that they were already facing this technology thing as they were buying these companies, should we replace people? Are people important enough to keep in certain jobs? Do we want to automate? And um, I was literally sitting in their office talking to them, a small little office, both in there. Uh, and I said, and I, I, we were talking about it. So I came back about uh, two months later with a business plan, and I said, this is what I believe you ought to do looking at these companies, which is talk to the people on the line. Find out what they're doing. Find out how they, how they see progress. What can be done to evaluate from their point of view and then make decisions based on that. And they both looked at me like I had horns and a tail. And these were progressive people, supposedly. Supposedly. Yeah. And it came down to, why would we do that? These are people on the line. They're supposed to be doing their work. We hire managers to make sure they do their work. If the managers aren't making sure they do their work, we hire new managers. We pay our managers well, we pay our people well. If they're not doing the work, they shouldn't be there. Why do we care what they think? <laughs> and I just went. Duh. And so I said, because this is the basis of your business, and I walked through everything, and they said, that was old time. Today, things are changing, and we don't care what people think. Progress is in automation and management. And that's, and so this was 1988. Mm. So that's... So obviously things are gonna have to change because if you have a mass of unemployed people, you're gonna have some problems. But I think that if uh, the problem is that we need to, as, as individuals, we need to re realize our responsibility to adapt and survive. And I realize once you're in your 50s, it's, it's, and that's a lot of the people that, that got laid off in the last thing that couldn't find jobs, uh, the last recession. So that, that is a harder thing to do that. I mean, you're not that far from you know, being able to retire. Uh, and so, but that's, that's a, uh, the idea of you're going to have to learn all your life. You're going to have to be constantly retrained because of the pace, because that's key. The pace of automation is, 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 is the problem, not automation itself. 
in disrupting society. And we need to let our um, representatives and uh, policy makers, our educational uh, leaders, that we are, we are on to this. We know that this is what needs to be looked into, not, not the blaming the foreigner or outsourcing, because if, you know, the companies are gonna outsource if it's economically going to, to work for them. And, uh, you know. Are you just, saying that re trying to renegotiate NAFTA isn't gonna work? <laughs> yeah, I'm saying it's not gonna work. I think that there are plenty of Americans that are gonna, that in the agricultural communities especially say it's not gonna work, <laughs> because it would really, uh, Okay, I think we're thoughtful, but we need to yeah, wrap up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I, but I think that's, that's where we need to end. This is what we need to do, we need to realize and get this out. So that's why we take this today. But it's also, again, I'm, I'm coming back to the people at the top. You can have the Milton Hershey's who say, mm -hmm. The people are important, or you can have the Gorham brothers. Well, you're say, always going to have that. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. the I guy think, at Malden Mills paid it, all of his employees after the mill burned right, down. He, he paid, paid everybody them. while, while it was being happened. rebuilt mm -hmm. and rebuilt it. And yep. rebuilt it. But so, but there's always that the, that tug and yeah. yeah. It's just as all right. As, so so it's progressing faster now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.